We're up to Esther chapter 4 uh, as we go alternate uh, Old and New Testament. And this is the material that is from Handbook to Scripture and it's used on daily growth email. I hope you're getting it. Just go to reflections.org and sign up if you're not getting it because it really would encourage you to use this. I hope you, uh, because it's it's like a mini Sabbath. You, can, you have an email, tells you, what scriptures to read and gives you responses and so forth. And then as a result, you're able to just look at it, even if you want to have a mini Sabbath, one minute, and you go off of it. And But it, it's not like Bible roulette. You, it guides you. And it tells you what to look for and what pray, things to pray. But one of the components, of course, is that we go through the Bible every year, and it has the 365 key chapters, and that's what this is. So uh, when the Jews, I'm up to Esther chapter 4, and in chapter 3, just to bring you up to where we were at the end of that, Haman's plot against the Jews and the king of Ahasuerus, otherwise known as Xerxes, um, was a man who was being manipulated by, his, uh, by Haman, and uh, he was a smooth talker, and Haman uh, wanted to actually scatter the peoples because of his anger at a particular Jew who wouldn't bow down in his presence, Mordecai the Jew. And so it goes beyond a normal uh, kind of approach. There's a kind of san insanity that I claim has often been, in fact, characteristic of the uh, situation with the people of God since their inception. One time after another, multiple genocide attempts, as we well know, the most recent being in even in our own uh, time. So the idea of that, and that even now in the media, where they're being mm -hmm. demonized, even though they're the victims, it, it just, it's, it's, it's more than astonishing, uh, the idea. But that said, um, the, um, the idea of this, the, the scribes were summoned, and so there was a, there was a, it was going to be, you're going to destroy, kill, annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, so he used this poor, this and threw lots every day until he finally hit the right day. And it was it turns out that this date is not an accidental date, it's Passover. So it would be and it was uh, a nefarious plot to destroy the Jews. Esther here learns of Haman's plot. So when Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. So, so to rent your garment, to tear your clothes, was a, a sign of great grief and mourning. And putting on sackcloth and ashes uh, would be a, a sign, a very visible sign of an, of an internal grief. And so this was a common thing. So it was humbling himself, and he wailed loudly and bitter, bitterly. And he went as far as the king's gate. For no one was to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In each and every province where the command and decree of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay on sackcloth and ashes. You can imagine this, that you're given a, ne a terminus, you're given an execution date, and all 120 satraps or provinces of Persia, which covered a huge um, uh, territory, massive, uh, almost to China and, and, and over up, up to Europe, it's a, it's a whole realm. It was a massive em, uh, empire in which emissaries were sent out on horses with various translations, one for each of the provinces. So they had to do this whole system, kind of a Pony Express. And they had to send out these people. And this was the edict that was given, and it had the king's seal and what is the law of the Medes and the Persian can ever be revoked. You see, so it's a binding thing. And to, for this to go out and you have your death date, you're given your time where they, they're going to be allowed to take them. And that's, I think, although it doesn't say it, I think that's how Haman was going to get the big bucks he was offering to the king. Because I don't know, see how he could amass 10,000 talents beyond that. Um, but one way of doing it would be for them to plunder it, you see, from the Jews and uh, to do it around the whole provinces and gather that together. I think that would probably be the system. So, he, so the king foolishly went along with it. Uh, he, didn't, he wasn't really paying much attention. He was more concerned about his own uh, 
kind of licking his own wounds because of uh, his defeat by the Greeks. And uh, he was now focusing on how great a man he was. He was a very kind of a thin ruler, throwing one banquet after another in his arrogance and, and pride. And as a consequence, he wasn't, ah, okay, go ahead and do it. Imagine then that you know, let's say, let's say it was a 12-month Egypt. Suppose you know for sure that's the day of your death. That'll have a bearing on you. Remember, we've talked about this before. When imagine you were given, you had 90 years, but now imagine instead you have only 90 days. It makes it much more interesting because you can't, you can't then avoid some big questions with nine, but it gets even more interesting when you have 90 minutes. You see, what are you thinking about? What should you be thinking about? And that's where, and then of course, 90 seconds. But the point here is that if even if it was exactly one year, if you knew the day with certainty that this is where you would die, it would have a sobering impact. That's not a bad diagnostic question to ask, by the way. It's a wise question every one of us in this room should be asking regularly. In fact, we should be asking, how do I know this is not my last night in this world? How do you know? Suppose you you have a year that you figure, you know, come now, you have... Uh, uh, have a business and make we're going to go to such and such a city and a year from now make a lot of profit you don't even know if you're going to be what your life will be like whether you'll be around that year long so that's wisdom for you to live that way but when you had this hard thing it was it produced this fasting weeping wailing sackcloth ashes part of that culture esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her and the, the queen it's an interesting image writhed in great anguish uh, being jewish of course but she had not revealed her identity to the king at one Mar Mordecai's advice. Don't reveal your people. Uh, there are unique people. I'm going to say something about them uh, today in, in just because I think there's a larger pattern goes on. History has vindicated not only in scripture, but it continued afterwards uh, into our present time. Um, then Esther summoned Hatak from the king's eunuchs whom the king had appointed to attend, ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. So Hatak went out to Mordecai to the city square in front of the king's gate. He wanted to find out. And so she, he, she sent him, and she would communicate with her uncle in this manner. Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict, which had been issued in Susa for their destruction. Susa being the capital city there of Persia. And so this is, this edict then goes, as I say, hundreds of miles throughout the north, east, south, and west. And to order her to go into the king to implore his favor and plead with him for her people. Hey, Thak came back and related Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and ordered him to reply to Mordecai, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king to the inner court who is not summoned, he has but one law, and that is to be put to death. That's a, you know, it's hard for you and me to imagine the power of an oriental potentate, you see, in this image of their absolute control. They have they hold the destinies of men in their hands, and just a one little nod here, a little thing there, and you're either going to be blessed or, or killed. It's an interesting thought, the power that these people have. Uh, and I have not been summoned to go come to the king for these 30 days. So if she did come uninvited, he'd have to hold up that scepter, or she'd be killed, even, as, uh, even the queen. They related Hester, I haven't been to him for these 30 days. They related Esther's words to Mordecai. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. And this is, I think, the most important uh, paragraph in this, in this book. Because it, it really relates to you and me as well in many respects. It's a powerful word. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, 
Relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. That's an interesting statement. It doesn't go further than that. Remember I told you before that this book never once mentions the name of the living God, of Yahweh. Doesn't have, never mentioned them by name. But this is the closest it gets to saying about the providential care, because the evidence of God's providence are all throughout this book, and so many details about the plot twists and turns that are clear that a hand is behind it. In this instance, though, he says, if you remain silent, there'll be another resource that would provide for the Jews, but you'll miss out on, the mom on your moment. And that's an interesting and almost terrifying word, to miss out on your moment, to realize you were called for such a time as this, weren't, weren't you? I'm going to make a comment about that, uh, and, and it re re relates to a thing that I do on this matter of identity and meaning and, and identity and purpose and hope. And so it, it relates to these four questions. It relates to their first question, meaning. Where did I come from? This is... This has to do with each one of us in this room. This is not theoretical stuff. So the fundamental, these are the four fundamental questions of life that most people are capable of averting and avoiding for the, for decades. It amazes me. The only time they're, in many instances, they're forced to think about these four questions is at a funeral. And they're, they're very uncomfortable. They writhe because it's a memento mori. It's opened up the window to their vulnerability, and they do not like it. It's almost like they're careening off the curve. They cry out to God, help me. And then when things get back into order, then they say, thanks for the help. I got the wheel now again. You see, and they forget what happened. So in that moment, that's why um, the, the, um, the grave, really, the, the, rather, rather the coffin is more of an evangelist than, than the, the cradle, as Archie put it. Um, and, and it is. So it, it reveals this is where we all go. Better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of mirth, as Ecclesiastes tells, because that's the true end of man, at least from a human perspective. Because from a human point, point of view, it's getting depressing as I get older. You see, it makes me look at this world as a very dark and, and bad world, and then it is in many ways. It's a fallen world. It's almost like it's a conveyor belt. And we're on this slow, slow, almost imperceptible conveyor belt. It moves so slowly you don't even notice it move day by day. But if you could do fast forward on your mirror, Im imagine you had a time lapse on your view of yourself in the mirror. That would be an ugly uh, thing. Because you're not getting better, guys. You're, ah. you're not looking better. Yeah. You peaked out a long time ago. At least uh, most, most of us did. But the point is, you were in a conveyor belt to diminishment, stenosis, atrophy, desiccation. I mean, it's a pre depressing thought. We're becoming like mummies. And it's even more depressing when I see old people trying to look like they're young. God, it was, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the Gloria Swanson syndrome in Holly, in, 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 the, in uh, Sunset Boulevard, remember, I'm ready for my, I'm, I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> if you ever saw that movie, it's worth seeing just for that, that closing part. But the point is, no, people can't, they, they don't even want to age naturally. See, they don't, because they don't want to give in to that conveyor belt. But we're all on it. And we see our friend and our loved ones moving from our hands. It's not the way it was meant to be. And I tell you, your answer to these questions is going to be something that's going to raise the bigger question of meaning, purpose, and hope, and so forth. Where did I come from? You see, if you came from anything but infinity and eternity, then you really don't have much meaning. You're just a cosmic blip on, the, on this cosmos. You come for the briefest of moments, and you're gone, and there's nobody who's going to remember you. Oh, but he'll be remembered by his friends. What happens when they die? You see, you, you just become, it's like a, a, a ripple of, in water and it just, as long as it lasts and then it's gone. So if you come, however, from an infinite and personal source of all things, you have great meaning. It, one who is a relational being, one who is the lover of your soul, one who has um, 
eternity and infinity in him. And there's a person that you can know and that he wants to know you. That gives you meaning. The second question, who am I? The big question of identity with this whole idea of who am I? And so these questions, who does God say that I am is the right question Mm -hmm. rather than who does the world say I am? So when you ask who God says you are, you have true identity because you, among other things, you've been adopted into the household of God if you are a follower of Jesus. You have been made new and, and given a new, uh, new nature and on and on all these things are true of it. Uh, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. We've been set free in Christ. I'm randomly choosing these things from this sheet. I'm, I'm, I'm a child, children of, uh, I'm a child of, he- citizen of heaven. So it goes. Third question. But if you're not, if your identity is not based upon the word, but by on the world, pretty fragile. You will, you will approach relationships out of a deficiency, not a sufficiency modality. Third question, why am I here? Another pretty basic question, wouldn't you agree? And that has to do with the issue of purpose. Have you been called for a purpose? What happens in, when we get late in the seasons of life, when we perhaps when we retire, do you lose your purpose? No, because your purpose is an unchanging reason for being. You have a vocation which transcends your career. You have a calling that goes beyond that. Most people, though, drop out of the race and miss out on their purpose. You still have a purpose. As long as you have life and breath, you have a purpose. And you have to wrestle with God as to what that looks like. And the fourth question is, you can guess, what's the next question? Where are you going? (laughs) It's pretty obvious. Pretty obvious. And again, this has to do with your hope. Do you have a future hope, or is life just a conveyor belt? Uh, Is it just the good old days? regret and remorse? Or is it possible that the greatest things that have ever happened to you, the greatest moments of greatest experiences, the greatest beauty, intimacy, and adventure, is it possible that those great moments are actually hints of better goods to come? So wonderful, so ineffable, so rich and magnificent that you cannot yet name them because it's beyond your imagination. But I promise you, your wildest imagination is not enough. It'll be greater than what you dream. It will, you will not be disappointed. And you will realize that the afflictions and adversities of this life were more than worth it. Even a century of adversity would be compensated by one day in his presence. You see, that's the, that's, that's the picture. So, and when I go back to this idea of, of purpose and hope then, she realized she's being told that you are here for a purpose. You have a calling. You have a realization. And so do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape anymore. You don't have, you're, you're not going to be covered. But if you remain silent, there'll be another source of provision. But have, have you been called? Who knows whether you have not attained royalty? And I often use this phrase for such a time as this. I often sign uh, emails for such a time as this, that it comes from this text, you see. For such a time as this tells me that there's a sense of urgency and without anxiety, if I, if I live pro- properly, I want to live with a sense of urgency, but not with a sense of any anxiety in my life. And so she's asked to do something that's a risk. But you see, you can't grow in Christ. You cannot become really a follower of him in terms of true discipleship, true sanctification without taking risks because discipleship and obedience to Christ is contrary to the world and contrary to your instinct. So obedience is countercultural and counterintuitive. It means that we are called to treasure the unseen over the seen and the not yet over the now, which is what the Hebrews 11 one tells us. So you know you're going to have to take a risk. At the same time, um, if you're risking everything on the promises character of God, then it's a well-founded risk, you see. It's not, it's not a, sh- a, a shot in the dark, but it's actually a step in the light. But a step must be made. You see, you need to, you, you need to move forward. He will, without God, as Augustine put it, at least it's attributed to him. Without God, we cannot. Without us, he will not. So that again, without God, we cannot. But without us, he will not. 
He will not use someone who's not willing to take risks. But you can only take risks if you have an eternal perspective in this temporal arena. That eternal perspective is nailed by the, your answer to those four questions. You see, and so you keep returning to those four questions. Where, where did I come from? Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? And if you have biblical answers to that, by the way, those four questions are also answered with scripture in a, a tool called morning affirmation. How many of you have that? If you have a copy of Hamburg to Prayer, it's also in that. But morning affirmation, we, have, we, you know, we also have a laminated version of that. You, you've heard me tell you about that. It's, it's got power in the shower. It's got a gra grommet in a suction cup. So you can put it in your bath or in your, I'd say put it in your mirror, not in the shower. I can't read. Um, but power in the shower or hope in a rope. But the point is, it's, uh, it really is the morning affirmations goes through the, where did I come from? Why am I here? Or who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? That's what it does. So you have to review that, I claim, on a daily basis. If you want to be smart, you have to review and remember and remind yourself. And ask the, that's why I asked those three questions, as I did several times already today. And what were those three questions? I did them when Chuck was praying, as I always do, before I speak. What do I seek? Who do I say you are? And do you love me more than these? these those three questions. Who do you say, who, what do you seek? Who do you say I am? Do you love me more? And just to do that is to recalibrate, to review, to remind yourself that this is who you are. And also, of course, then with that, the other three, and it, it is the question of uh, trust the Father. My relationship with the Father is one of trust. Abide in the Son is to receive my life from Him. And third, walk by the Spirit, keep in step, and walk in His power. And so, when you do that, it's kind of like a little mini moment where you can recalibrate at any time and review and remind yourself throughout the course of the day, oh yes, this is who I am. Otherwise, you're going to live as if you didn't know Jesus, as if you were basically an atheist and uh, give lip service to, to Jesus on certain occasions. And then you'll have a bifurcated life, a sacred secular dichotomy that's not healthy at all because you'll treat the secular and, and as in one way, the so-called spiritual another, which is nuts. Because really, everything is spiritual. If the focus of your heart is the eternal, everything becomes spiritual. My focus of my heart is the eternal. The ordinary becomes extraordinary, brought into the purposes of God. Even the most mundane so-called act, of other-centered love or prayer or service. And there's three things, as I tell people, we can do even when we're 105. You can love people, pray for them, and serve them, even if you only have one person in your life. And even if you're about to die, you can still do those. Why am I here? You're here for a reason. Don't miss out. So that's what I see in this text and as I go to this. Um, so Esther told him to reply to Mordecai, go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa. Fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens will fast in the same way. And thus, I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. She mentions that again. Because I'm, in other words, she knows she's risking her life. Because there's no assurance she's going to lift up that golden scepter. Scepter, he hasn't seen her in 30 days. She's been uninvited. And sometimes kings in a bad mood, you know, just how they're feeling, whether they feel good or, or bad, you know, may, may be suffering a bit of indigestion, somebody loses his life. If I perish, but she says, and if I perish, I perish. I think there's a commentary on Esther with that name, if I perish, I perish. You see, because there is a resolve, she's saying, okay, I'm going to put it in the line. And she's realized she was convicted by that word, wasn't it? Uh, if I perish, it. so Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded him. So you can see the drama, and this is a truly dramatic little book. And if you put them all together, you realize you're dealing with uh, something that's filled with suspense, very Hitchcockian kind of a film, very much a film. I wish Alfred Hitchcock had done this plot with a different setting and scene, so it wouldn't be painfully obvious it's Esther. He would have done a great job with it. But the point is, because it's full of suspense, and being hung on your own petard, you see, to be hung on your own gallows that you made for your enemy is pretty interesting. 
delicious ironies abound. Um, so one of the things that comes to my mind, though, there are several things that come to my mind. This business of fasting comes to my mind. I hate fasting. I don't know about you, but when I look at fasting, um, so if I go to if I go to conform to his image for a moment here, so I'm going to um, see here. Um, I'm talking about the spiritual disciplines. There's a, there's a, one of the chapters, or what are the spiritual disciplines? Uh, so on discipline spirituality, and I give a bunch of them. I list uh, the disciplines of uh, of solitude and silence are two of the disciplines, and I mention uh, prayer, journaling, study and meditation. Fasting and chastity, secrecy, confession, fellowship, uh, submission and guidance, simplicity, stewardship and sacrifice, uh, worship and celebration. Uh, these are and service and witness. And then I go focus, zoom in more on two disciplines of abstinence: the discipline of solitude and the discipline of silence. Two disciplines of abstinence. Very few men practice solitude and silence. And then I go into three disciplines of engagement, which are which are study, and, and then I go into uh, uh, med after that study um, prayer, and, um, the, and 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 then lectio divina. So I go into that. But let me go back to where I was with this fasting business here. Fasting and charity. The spiritual discipline of fasting is. Um, abstention from physical nourishment for the purpose of spiritual sustenance. So it's kind of transmuting the physical and t turning it into a symbol of the spiritual, going from the material to that. This difficult discipline, you notice I call it a dis difficult discipline, Practi requires practice before it can be effective. But since it is not natural for us to pursue self-denial, there are different methods and degrees of fasting. So there are different, uh, let's see, I've got the wrong thing on there, that's why. Not at all what I intended. Did quit on me, didn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, let's go back to where we are. Different degrees of fasting uh, and different methods as well. But this business of self-denial, especially the physical, it reveals things about yourself. Um, all of them promote self-control and reveal the degree to which we are ruled by our bodily appetites. It's a revelator. And it doesn't have to be just food, you see. So fasting, as I say, can also uh, consist of abstention from other things that control us, such as television and other forms of entertainment. Now. I really uh, should have added, of course, um, digital apparatus from smartphones and so forth. Fasting from technology. And a technology fast, even if it's only a portion of the day, can be an interesting re revealer because there are some people who are just constantly, this thing is drawing them all day long. If you look at people's habits, it'd be interesting to see a time lapse of, of the average person's life who's really constantly looking at these things the gaming and the media and all, all that, um, you'd find that there's some, some of the people spending six plus hours a day uh, doing this. And um, for them, it would be uh, like they would be getting the, um, the the emotional DTs, you see. Digital de delirium tremens. <laughs> um, but, it, it would, but really, it's an interesting, when, when David White um, when you take your boys off to a foreign land, tell them what you do. Oh, so they... We're always everyone now, anywhere from nine years old, years old, 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 first, first, that point, conjoining, looking out the bus. 
good work. I've been learning a lot more. So I'm so the older teenagers, several of these tours, the shop run. Here, who was forwards that that just don't that's a that's so counter cultural. No, it, it, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I can do it. <laughs> so obviously it's not just food. It's anything that might control you. It's an interesting way of putting it. So don't show. Um, um, but I came across this list of church bulletin bloopers, and one of them had to do with fasting, you see. So um, um, the cost of attending the fasting and prayer conference includes meals. I I, I just love these. I have a, I have, a, I have a bunch of. Ber Bertha Belch, a missionary from Africa, will speak tonight at Calvary Memorial Church. Come and hear Bertha Belch all the way from Africa. The ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind. They can be, they may be seen in the basement on Friday afternoon. <laughs> uh, a bean supper will be held on Tuesday evening in the church hall. Music will follow. <laughs> at the evening choir uh, even service tonight the sermon topic it will be what is hell come early and listen to our choir practice <laughs> I just love these stupid blue but presumably these are real blue church bulletins and I'm not surprised because I've seen some screwball church bulletins next Sunday pa the pastor will preach his last sermon in his farewell message the choir will sing, break forth into joy. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just... Oh, Barbara remains in the hospital and needs blood donors. She is having trouble sleeping and wants tapes of the pastor's sermons. <laughs> that, that, that'll put her to sleep. <laughs> Weight Watchers will meet at 7 p.m. At, at First Presbyterian Church. Please use the large double door at the side entrance. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. I, I'm just, I'm just. There's one I'm trying to find here. Yeah. Uh, that's enough. I better stop. Well, well, blades. Don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. <laughs> It's crazy stuff. But you go to this, um, this business of uh, fasting, and I realize that, you know, I'm, I've got to myself take that on into account and, in a more serious manner. And uh, because you see, it's each of us, you may do very well in one area. It's, and it's good to be brutally honest with yourself where you're getting, you, you tolerate a certain measure of indulgence, you see, and then the, your disciplines can slip. So if anything, the fasting is not an end in itself, but a means to intimacy with Christ because it reveals things about ourselves that would not be known if we did not actually find the thing removed. You see, that's exactly the point. When, so when, a, when a, someone goes away and you're forced not to have this for, for a week, there's a certain great relief. But then, man, I'm glad to have it back again. So it's a, it's a, it's a curse and a blessing. But at any rate, uh, that's something for our, for us to consider as well. Just this whole area, fasting. But I'm 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 in time, inclined to think though that uh, when I'm looking at these 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 concepts, um, you're dealing with a unique situation. And I wanted to bring you back to what I was mentioning before about the uniqueness of Israel in a situation that contextualizes this because it it's really unusual. A friend asked me a little bit about that, and so I came up with a list of seven points um, in an email. I figured it would be useful. Seven unique things about Israel and the Jewish people. Number one, the most persecuted people in history, and they've been around a long time. 
Number two, the people were scattered among the nations in, eight, in the year 70, AD 70, and yet have now regathered in their ancient homeland. That's never been heard of or seen ever before. Utterly unique. I don't know how people try to, can even rationalize this. That they were gathered throughout the world and scattered rather in the diaspora. And now, now for the first time, in fact, it's only been a couple of years, there are more Jews in Israel than there are anywhere else in the world. And so it used to be Brooklyn, it used to be New York, but now it's Israel, about 52% or more, and it's growing. So more and more will, as if prophet, if, if my understanding of prophecy is that they will be the regathering to their land more and more as time goes by. The people, um, number three, uh, all of this was prophesied in the Hebrew Bible. So this is another thing that you have this whole Hebrew narrative that records and, and anticipates that they would be scattered throughout the world, but first they would be scattered by the Babylonians and the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, uh, but then later uh, 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 throughout the entire world. A new exodus of the people to, to their homeland took place after the Holocaust. You know, there were 18 million Jews, six, uh, 12 million were left after that uh, Holocaust. Nothing ever seen anything like that in that respect. And yet that, that somehow created the exodus, Leon Uris's exodus, as you've given that name for a reason. Because if it were not for that, they would not have returned to their land. So, it's a very deep and profound mystery, but uh, so that they have now, um, this is what's happened. This is another thing that's utterly unique. The ancient language of Hebrew was lost, but it was recovered in the 19th century. Never in human history has an ancient language been recovered. And now you speak Hebrew in Israel, you can read the Hebrew Bible. It's like reading a Middle English, but you can read it. And maybe not quite as bad as that, but you can read it. Now, there's a point, it's an ancient language that's been recaptured. In fact, only the, the, the priests knew Hebrew. It was, it was Aramaic that most of the people spoke in Jesus' time. But this was a language um, that now is the language of the people, which is an astonishing thought. Uh, nothing like that ever before. Uh, Number six, Israel is second only to the United States in high-tech startups, and it is a world technological power, powerhouse. It really is. I thought it was interesting as well uh, that the Jewish people have won close to 30% of the Nobel Prize. And by the way, they lost, they won fewer during the First and Second World War for, 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 for various reasons, especially uh, anti-Semitic policies, but only 16 million people. Now, they're, up, they're back up to about 15.7 million people. That's disproportionate, to say the least. Um, you have some other things that are unique. Um, it's um, the highest average living standards of the Middle East. It's the only liberal democracy in the Middle East. Um, it's the only country in the world that's uh, entered the 21st century with a net gain in its number of trees. Even little details like that made more remarkable because this was achieved in an area considered mainly desert. Um, there's so many things. Medicine, the first fully computerized, no, no, um, no radiation diagnostic instrumentation for breast cancer. One achievement after another. Uh, leads the world in number of scientists and technicians in the workforce with 145 per 10,000, as opposed to 85 in the U.S. Um, just uh, one thing after another. Just uh, all, the, all these things, are these achievements, while engaged in regular wars with an implacable enemy that seeks its destruction, economy continuously under strain by having to spend more per capita on its own protection than any other country on earth. Cell phone was developed in Israel by Israeli branch of Motorola. Most of the Windows uh, and NT and XP operating systems developed by Microsoft Israel. Pentium microprocessor, mostly likely made there. The fourth biggest, uh, largest air force in the world. Um, just um, So it's just amazing. Our most impenetrable fight, flight security, the highest uh, ratio of university degrees to population, um, more scientific papers per capita, um, largest number of startup companies in the world in proportion to its population, largest number of biotech startups, um, and so forth. Just one after another, uh, number two in the world for venture capital funds right behind the United States. 
um, outside the United States and Canada has the largest number of NASDAQ listed companies. This thing is the size of New Jersey. And they're surrounded by 500 million enemies who seek their destruction. And it's an intriguing thing in our time. We now have this mindset that if a person is construed as being a victim, they've been oppressed, they now can do no wrong. I don't know where this comes from. Um, so there's a, a demonization. And I know there's two sides of a coin. And, I, and I'm not saying Israel has by any means been some model of virtue in certain many respects, but there are things that are quite unusual. And I predicted way back in the 70s that more and more, more and more attention, it was obvious from reading the scriptures as we get in toward, toward the end times, I predicted more and more that there would not only be persecution in this country for being a believer, and now it's begun, but also uh, that Israel would be in the, on, the, on the papers often in the front cover throughout the, uh, as with increasing frequency, as it is. Uh, so I mentioned all this um, because I do believe that the people of God, I do believe they've get, they're there in unbelief. So I'm not saying that they, that they're, that they are um, better people or in the sense to say that they are um, uh, righteous or, and so, so there's, there's a, there's a both end because there's a lot of oppression on both sides. So I'm not saying that. Uh, so I'm not demonizing um, the the uh, the Arab states and so forth. But I'm saying there's something going on here that's pretty unique. The things I just gave you are pretty unique. And given that, I think that if they are in fact the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the twelve tribes of Israel, if indeed they are the line through whom Messiah would reach the world. If indeed they have been given the Abrahamic bless, blessing, the land, seed, and blessing, and through you all the nations of the world would be blessed. If indeed they have been given this, uh, this is a lineage to be the Messiah, they, it does make them a unique people. And to whom much has been given, much will be required. So there's a playoff on that. My own view of prophecy is that ultimately, the, there will be a seven-year tribulation, and it'll have two purposes. The first purpose will be to judge the nation. The second person purpose will be to bring Israel into salvation through their affliction and adversities that they will encounter. All Israel will be saved ultimately, according to Romans eleven. So uh, it's just a question of that time. Um, so. It, it, so that at the end, the Rosh Hashanah will be complete, the ivory gathering will be complete, and the Messiah will come for his people. But it is through these people that all the lands of the world will be blessed, because it is through Israel, that uh, it is through the people of God, that Messiah has come, and Jesus was a Jew, and he is a Jew. So it's a, it's a hard thing for us to grasp and imagine. This is why it always struck me in the church that anti, anti-Jewish sentiments, what their own Messiah is presumably Jewish. I never could figure that one out. What, are, what are they giving him a buy? Just, you know, just saying. He, he's not really Jewish. I don't, why? I, and I marvel at that. So what I'm saying is there's a kind of sense in which this is going to happen. It's not to say that they are, are in belief yet, but they will be. And Daniel, the whole book of Daniel, is to show the the, the the judgment of the nation, so that you have you have the um, Babylon, the Assyrian, and the the, the Babylonian, and the, then the then the Persian, the Medo Persian Empire, then the Greeks and the Romans, and then there'll be a Rome too, and there will be a unification here against the purposes of God, and ultimately there will be a time such as the world has never seen. My own view is that we that the followers of Jesus, his bride, will be taken uh, before that, that horrendous time. Now, that others may disagree with me on that, but my own view is that um, he will come um, and bring us to the Father's house. So that the church was a mystery in the Hebrew Bible, never known. And so given that, it was something that was not known, uh, but now has been revealed in the New Testament. So that the that these prophecies of the day of the Lord have nothing to do with the church. It's an entirely different thing. By the way, the end game isn't the church. The end game is the kingdom. 
The church is the bride of the Messiah, the bride of the king. We will rule and reign with him over the kingdom. My, his kingdom will come, his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you and I are part of that bride, and the bride consists both of Jews and Gentiles. So it's a, 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 a comb combination at Pentecost when the church was birthed that that is really suddenly now a whole new thing that's been brought into being. Uh, so I'm throwing all that at, at you. I know it's a lot of things to talk about there, but I do see, think that this book does emphasize a unique condition, relief and help, and that God would deliver his people, but you can be sure that there are more things to come along these lines.